the Catalans, the Basques, the Galicians in the, the Basque. Just looking at the, the overall share uh, numbers for Scotland at the moment, the SNP Good morning. Can I remind members that social distancing measures are in place in the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus, and I ask that members take care to observe these measures, including when entering and exiting the Chamber. And please only use the aisles and walkways to access your seat and when moving around the Chamber. The first item of business is general questions. In order to get as many people in as possible, short and succinct questions and answers to match would be helpful. If a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button or indicate so in the chat function by entering the letter R during the relevant question. And I call Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its assessment is of the impact parental smoking has on child poverty. Minister Marie Todd. Reducing the use of and harm caused by tobacco products is one of Scotland's public health priorities. Given that smoking is more prevalent in our most deprived communities, in particular where there is a greater risk to children and young people from exposure to secondhand smoke, we have set specific smoking cessation targets for our cessation services, which are focused entirely on these communities. Eradicating child poverty is a national mission for this government, and we will set out further action to deliver at the pace and scale required as part of our next Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan, published in March 2022. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Minister for that answer. Billions of pounds has rightly been invested in protecting people from COVID-19, and yet smoking remains a huge killer also. Year on year, with 9,332 deaths in Scotland directly attributable to smoking in 2018. Given that smoking disproportionately impacts the most deprived households and taking into account the health and financial costs to families, what more will the Scottish Government do to help people quit smoking, enabling them, enabling them to both improve their health and their financial circumstances? Minister. Mr Gibson makes a very good point. Reducing health inequalities and increasing healthy life expectancy are priorities for the Scottish Government, and smoking has been the primary preventable cause of ill health and premature death for many years. The Scottish Government 
published its five-year strategy, Raising Scotland's Tobacco-Free Generation, in June 2018. And the action plan sets out interventions and policies to help reduce the use of and the associated harms from tobacco in Scotland. This plan focuses on the inequalities within groups of people that smoke, prevention and reduction of uptake of smoking among young people, and providing the best possible support for those people who want to give up. The Scottish Government have introduced a 2034 tobacco-free target. Our aim is to reduce smoking rates to 5% or below by 2034, creating a generation of people who do not want to smoke and are protected from the harms of smoking. The Tobacco Control Action Plan 2018 continues our work on protecting children from taking up the habit of smoking and creating a tobacco-free generation by 2034. And in addition, anyone who wants to stop smoking can contact the free NHS Stop Smoking Service, Quit Your Way Scotland. This free helpline produces, provides advice and support and can directly direct individuals to local support services to help people find their own way to stub out this habit. Thank you. Question number two, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to implement the recommendations of Scotland's drowning prevention strategy. Minister Ash Denham. The Scottish Government takes the issue of water safety very seriously and welcomed the drowning prevention strategy when it was published by Water Safety Scotland in 2018. And I'd like to thank Clara Adamson for her contribution to the strategy and her continued support to Water Safety Scotland, which has a, obviously a linchpin role in this area. And as she will know, the Scottish Government continues uh, to provide funding via ROSPA to support the operation of Water Safety Scotland. And additionally, this year, the Scottish Government has worked with partners to support a number of water safety activities and campaigns. We also work closely with Water Safety Scotland and other partners to support the recommendations in its drowning prevention strategy and initiatives that can help raise awareness of the hazards around water and reduce deaths from accidental drowning. And on the 11th of August, I convened a meeting with a range of key stakeholders to drive further action around delivery of the drowning prevention strategy. And I'll be convening a follow-up meeting later on this month. Claire Adamson. And I thank the Minister for her response. We were all shocked and saddened at the numerous reports of drowning fatalities in Scotland, including my own constituencies, and we send our condolences to all those affected. Uh, and it is wonderful to see um, ROSPA and Water Safety Scotland developing a host of educational resources in school. The UNCRC Article 24 enshrines the right to access education and information on the prevention of accidents for children and their caregivers. What steps will the Scottish Government take to ensure that Article 24 of the UNCRC is realised for children in Scotland and that water safety education is promoted across our constituencies? Minister. I am grateful that the relevance of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child has been highlighted today in the Chamber by the Member. And it's because we attach such fundamental importance to the rights and well-being of our children that we've legislated to incorporate the Convention uh, as far as possible into Scots law. And when this Parliament voted in March unanimously to approve the legislation, it was a milestone and not an end point. And work needs to be ramped up to ensure that the Convention's Provisions being, bring real-life benefit to our children. And that applies to the provisions of Article 24, which relates to health and well-being, which includes that ensuring that all segments of society, in particularly parents and children, are informed, have access to education, and are supported in the prevention of accidents. And we're not setting off, of course, from a standing start. A lot of good work on education around risk assessment and accident prevention is already being undertaken. And we also have the underlying contribution made by the Getting It Right for Every Child programme. So we have a very good platform on which to build. Um, with specific regard to prevention of accidental drowning, we will absolutely be strengthening our work with key organisations, including Water Safety Scotland and ROSPA, to identify and deliver the most effective ways of facilitating access to appropriate education and support. Jackie Bailey. The Minister will be aware of the tragic drownings that have occurred at Loch Lomond this summer. Indeed, every year there are tragedies. Last year, following the tragic death of Ava Gray, I wrote to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to ask them to site a rescue boat at Ballach. It is currently sited at Knightswood, which is some 25 minutes away, on a good day. I want to praise the work of the Lust Rescue Boat, but it's run by volunteers, 
and Loch Lomond is 39 kilometres long. So there is a clear need to do more. Will the Minister ensure that the location of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Boat is reviewed as a matter of urgency? Minister. I thank the member for that answer. As I said in my previous answer, um, when I convened the meeting on the 11th of August, um, a range of stakeholders were there. Um, as you would imagine, Scottish Fire and Rescue were there. I specifically asked Scottish Fire and Rescue to review the location of their assets to, to, for exactly that reason, to look at that going forward. And I think the member's right to raise Loch Lomond. But I think also there's no simple um, single answer to the challenge of drowning prevention. So things like education, um, there's obviously a role for signage, for life-saving equipment, and all water can be dangerous. But the member is right to point out that some locations um, where the dangers are more significant and where it's especially important that there's clear warning signage and appropriate life-saving equipment. And I will again speak to um, uh, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service about this particular incident, and I will come back to the member. Question number three, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle anti-social use of quad bikes, trail bikes and other off-road vehicles. Minister Ash Denham. I am well aware of the risk to public safety caused by careless, inconsiderate and anti-social driving. And that is why I fully support Police Scotland and its partners in dealing with the misuse of vehicles in an appropriate and a proportionate way. And local policing teams are ideally placed to engage with members of the local community to identify where the misuse of vehicles is causing distress to the public. And that ensures that in those areas that they can be prioritised for proactive action to prevent future instances and identify and deal with those engaged in the misuse of vehicles. Neil Bibby. Uh, thank the Minister for that answer. Yeah, over the summer, I've been uh, taking surgeries to streets in my community, and I can tell the Minister there's growing concern about antisocial behaviour and the inappropriate use of quad bikes and other off-road vehicles. It's not only a danger to the rider, it's a danger to pedestrians and the wider public. Often the people most affected by this antisocial behaviour are the least likely to come forward with their concerns. So can I ask uh, the Minister on their behalf, will she meet with me to discuss how we help Police Scotland make our communities safe and reclaim our footpaths, our parks and our public spaces from the dangerous antisocial minority who are misusing these vehicles? Minister. Um, of course, I'd be happy to meet with the member to discuss this, but just for context, um, on the 13th of March in 2020, I asked my officials to write out to all local authorities in Scotland to ascertain the extent to which the antisocial use of motorcycles and quad bikes is a problem in their areas, and if it is a problem, how they're currently addressing it. And I'm pleased to say that all 32 local authorities um, replied to that request, and I can inform you that the antisocial use of motorcycles and quad bikes um, is not a widespread problem across Scotland. Six local authorities, though, did report that they had an ongoing problem with antisocial use of motorcycles or quad bikes in their area, and four of whom said it was a seasonal occurrence. But I would be happy to meet with the member to discuss this further if he would like. Question number four, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to help protect people participating in football activities, particularly children and young people, in light of research suggesting a link between repeated heading of footballs and dementia in later life. Minister Marie Todd. The Scottish Government want people to, be, uh, to take part in sport and physical activity within a safe environment. We are in regular contact with the Scottish FA to discuss a range of issues from developing the game to safety issues. The Scottish FA produced guidance with Dr John McLean of the Hamden Sports Medicine Centre, which has provided clubs and coaches with a robust set of guidelines on heading. They are clear that they do not recommend heading practice in primary children's football, and they have a set of graduated guidelines for when they reach secondary. Audrey Nicholl. I thank the Minister for her answer. The Minister will be aware of the sad news of the legendary Manchester United football player, Aberdeen-born and bred Dennis Law, who recently confirmed his diagnosis of mixed dementia. He believes repeated heading of footballs may have played a part in this. Policies such as Frank Laws are an excellent way to ensure people, support for people affected by dementia. So can I ask the Minister if the Scottish Government has plans to build on this landmark piece of legislation? Minister. Um, 
firstly, to note um, the, the announcement by Dennis Law that he is suffering from dementia. I think it's, um, I, I, obviously I'm very sad about that, but I think it's great when people who are heroic and have a, a status that he does in our society stand up and say that they're suffering from that illness and that reduces some of the stigma and fear for everyone else in the population. So I'm grateful for his doing that. Um, in terms of um, support for people with, fund with um, dementia, we've been very clear over the, that over the course of this Parliament we'll substantially increase funding for both the NHS and social care. We're planning to increase public investment in social care by 25% over the Parliament, so that by the end of the Parliament we'll have budgeted over £800 million of increased annual support for social care compared to current spending. And that's absolutely necessary because in, at the moment in the general population over 80s face a one in three risk of dementia. So we need to remain focused on this and we will remain focused on this. Question number five, Sarah Boyack. Question Can number five, Sarah Boyack. Uh, Can I apologise, presiding officer, I don't have this to do. And I apologise to the Chamber for that. I wasn't ready to go there. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will commit to enshrining a rule in the National Planning Framework 4, where for every new building, 1% of the cost is given to the arts. Minister Tom Arthur. The Scottish Government will lay a draft National Planning Framework in Parliament this autumn for scrutiny, alongside a comprehensive programme of public in consultation. As set out in our position statement last year, NPF 4 will include stronger planning policies to support our creative industries. Can I thank the Cabinet, Se Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? Um, will he accept that there is a need for increased investment in our arts? And one of the ways that can be do that, and indeed is being done in many countries across the world, is to ensure that there is a percent for art regime in place through the planning system that enables local authorities and local communities to get the investment that they all desperately need as they don't just recover from the pandemic, but we see new opportunities across our communities. Minister. I absolutely recognise the vital role that culture play in our communities. Indeed, um, last week I was visiting Dundee Waterfront where we see the transformational impact of the BNA, and this is something that is referenced in our position statement that we published last year, alongside the developments that are taking place in Paisley, another example of Scottish Government investment in arts and culture supporting regeneration. And of course, the Government is committed to taking forward the percentage for our scheme, but this is a, a complex area that will require consideration. So I look forward uh, to Ms Boyack's engagement on that, just as I look forward to her engagement on the draft National Planning Framework 4 when it is laid before Parliament in the autumn. Question number six, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its programme for mental health within the NHS recovery plan. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we published our NHS recovery plan on Wednesday, the 25th of August, and we will update on our programme for delivery of these commitments in due course. The plan commits to ensuring that at least 10 per cent of frontline health spending will be dedicated to mental health, with at least 1 per cent directed specifically to services for children and young people by the end of this parliamentary session. The plan also commits to 1,000 additional staff in primary care, meaning every GP practice will have access to a mental health and wellbeing service. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to the Minister for that reply. This week, Audit Scotland shared serious concerns about the way in which the children and young people's mental health is being cared for across Scotland. Indeed, the number waiting more than a year for treatment trebled in the last 12 months. And yet the Re NHS recovery plan said CAMS waiting lists will be cleared by 2023. Will the Minister give assurances to this chamber that the people waiting will have access to the best care and there won't be young people parked on medication or referred to online interventions? as a means of clearing this target. Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, I, I should say to the, the member that says so far this year 
Uh, we have already invested uh, an additional £29.1 million um, from the Recovery and Renewal Fund into child and adult adolescent mental health services uh, to help clear backlogs. Uh, but beyond that, um, President Officer, um, one of the things that uh, the government wants to ensure um, is that folks do not have to access these services in the first place. And that's one of the, re why the, uh, the reasons why our investment uh, will look at the well-being of children uh, across the board uh, so uh, that no child reaches the crisis point of having to access CAMS. Uh, and I'm very pleased uh, that as we move forward, uh, there will be a, a much greater focus on community health, uh, help in all of this uh, and uh, in using digital sources as well, uh, including uh, cognitive behaviour therapies online, uh, which can help us achieve that to stop that crisis point from happening. Fiona Hislop. Does the Minister agree that supporting NHS recovery with more community and voluntary sector-based therapies for 18 to 25-year-olds will help in preventing escalation of mental health issues for a significant number of young people in the future? But what can be done immediately to cope with demands now when escalation does happen? I'm seriously concerned that a lack of beds in Lothian for severe eating disorders is denying my constituents the acute life-saving treatments that they need and can the Minister agree to look urgently into the inpatient mental health treatment provision? Minister. Um, I, I thank uh, Ms Hislop for what is a, a very important question um, and we recognise that uh, not all young people uh, need speci specialist services like CAMS uh, and that's why we've provided an additional £15 million of funding uh, to local authorities to, to deliver uh, locally based mental health and wellbeing support uh, for five to 24 year olds in their communities. Um, I want to uh, assure Ms Hislop that I've been in contact uh, with NHS Lothian about the concerns uh, that uh, they have been raised by her constituents. Um, and I also uh, want to share with the Chamber um, that we have already committed an additional £5 million of resource um, uh, to support the delivery uh, of the recommendations from the National Review of Eating Disorder Service, um, with the majority of that funding going directly to health boards uh, to increase um, uh, the help uh, because of an increased uh, presentation uh, of folk with eating disorder um, requirements. Uh, and we expect all boards, including NHS Lothian, uh, to pr prioritise that spend to get it right for patients. Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Earlier this week, two Green MSPs joined Nicola Sturgeon's government, taking the total number of ministers up to 29. Did all 29 agree with her proposals to introduce vaccine passports? First Minister. It will be Parliament next week that decides whether or not to introduce uh, vaccine certification. I set out the reasons. Uh, for the Scottish Government's uh, view on that yesterday. Uh, of course, uh, all ministers, uh, all 29 hard-working, dedicated ministers uh, are bound by collective responsibility uh, under the Ministerial Code. Uh, this is a question of how we best uh, continue to control COVID um, and to do that in the least restrictive, most proportionate way. And I think vaccine certification in the limited way I set out yesterday uh, has a role to play in doing that. Douglas Ross. The First Minister refused to say if they all agreed at the time of her announcement if they uh, supported vaccine passports, because it seems that this coalition of chaos, which the First Minister described as a, a leap of faith earlier on this week, is already a, a leap into the dark for the Greens. But they are not the only people in Scotland who have no idea how vaccine passports are going to work. Hospitality groups say the lack of engagement is extremely concerning. Scottish football clubs have warned the SNP's plans are completely unworkable. Industry groups need answers about this scheme before her government introduces it. Why haven't they had that chance? First Minister. Well, firstly, perhaps Douglas Ross should first and foremost 
concentrate on uh, what his view on vaccine certification is, uh, whether he supports it or opposes it, or whether he's going to continue simply to engage in the infantile opposition uh, that characterises so much of the Conservatives' response uh, to COVID. This is... This is a global pandemic. It demands of politicians, particularly those of us in government, uh, really tough decisions, and we've all got a responsibility to live up to that. Secondly, on the detail, we will, before we bring uh, this proposal to Parliament, uh, for Parliament to debate and decide through a vote on whether we go ahead with this, uh, the detail of how uh, a scheme will work. But can I say to Douglas Ross, had I stood here yesterday or even today um, and announced as a fait accompli exactly how every single aspect of this was going to operate, Douglas Ross would be here today criticising me for taking for granted the views of Parliament and not giving Parliament its proper place. So we will do this properly. We will do this in the way that people uh, have a right to expect of their government. Um, and of course, uh, we see across a range of uh, different sectors yesterday, an understanding of the reasons for this. Nobody wants any form of restrictions, but while we have this virus, we have to determine uh, the least restrictive way of keeping people safe. So, you know, Jeff Ellis of DF Concerts, the government are doing all they can to avoid another uh, lockdown as an industry. We all have to support that. We all have to do our bit. Uh, we see from the Federation of Small Businesses, uh, we don't want the prospect of stricter restrictions, so we believe the business community will accept uh, this change. The uh, Scottish Football Supporters Association, if COVID certificates are what it takes to allow fans to keep supporting their clubs, then it's better than no fans present. Uh, so a degree of understanding and pragmatism uh, for people on the front line, perhaps uh, Douglas Ross should take a leaf out of their book uh, and also engage in this issue with a degree degree of responsibility and recognition of the severity of the situation we face. Douglas Ross. There is absolutely no responsibility from Nicola Sturgeon to have questions at First Minister's questions that she fails to answer. I was asking about engagement. I was asking uh, about her government. And Parliament will debate these plans, but it would be nice to know exactly what we are debating. Because at the moment, hospitality groups, football clubs and venues have no idea about what infrastructure will be in place or if they'll get any help to introduce this. It's just another example of the shambolic, last-minute, knee-jerk decision-making of this government. The same government that brought you confusion over what is a cafe now brings you confusion over what is a nightclub. John Swinney U-turned on vertical drinking, now he's U-turned on COVID passports. A month ago, he was against them. Just this morning, at the COVID committee, the Deputy First Minister suggested they could be permanent. This government has had months to prepare to get this right. If any of this has been properly thought through, will Nicola Sturgeon tell us exactly what infrastructure will be in place, who will administer it, what financial support will be available, and is the Deputy First Minister correct that these passports might be permanent? First Minister. Oh, firstly... Can I say that in the face of a global pandemic of an infectious virus, uh, the public should be, and I suspect are, very wary of politicians who suggest that any government should take a dogmatic, unchanging position, because that is not the way you keep the public safe. Um, in terms of uh, looking at this, we have been considering it carefully. Um, I could paper uh, the walls of this chamber, probably, with quotes from me expressly saying that we hadn't ruled this out, that we wanted to consider it carefully. We were keeping our minds open. We had ruled out ever asking for vaccine passports for essential public services. But for uh, settings like nightclubs, there was a debate to be had and a case to be made. Now, Douglas Ross frequently, uh, and again, regular viewers uh, of First Minister's questions, I'm not sure how big a group that is, but regular viewers uh, will have heard Douglas Ross uh, say to me that this government needs to respect Parliament. So what we did, Cabinet discussed this on Tuesday. Um, I came to Parliament to tell Parliament first yesterday that this was uh, the government's intention, that we would take that uh, to Parliament next week. Uh, we, will, we are engaging with sectors uh, across the economy. We'll put the detail to Parliament to allow Parliament to decide, and then we, assuming Parliament agrees, we will implement this. That is not just the way government should operate. It is often, um, until it doesn't suit him, the way Douglas Ross demands that government operates. You know, this is 
is a serious situation, a really serious situation again, uh, not just for Scotland, for the UK, for many countries across Europe, where vaccine certification in many of those countries is already operating. Is it too much to expect in these serious times that we have a leader of the opposition that can engage properly with the substance of these matters? <laughs> Douglas Ross. Is it too much to expect to have a First Minister to answer First Minister's questions? Unless the First Minister has failed to notice it, Parliament is sitting at the moment, elected MSPs are asking her questions and she's unable to answer. She may be able to paper the walls with her views on COVID passports, but she has been singly failed to answer a single question about what that will mean for businesses and industries across Scotland. Now, this government used to grandstand about its handling of the pandemic. You don't hear those boasts anymore. And from the display from the First Minister today, it looks like vaccine passports are going to add to a long list of failures from this government. We heard today that thousands of long COVID sufferers in Scotland can't get referred to a support service. Yet the SNP's flimsy pamphlet on NHS recovery didn't contain a single mention of long COVID. A e waiting times are the worst in six years. Drug deaths, the worst in seven years. Alcohol deaths, the worst in eight years. People can't get to see their GP and they're waiting hours for an ambulance. The First Minister is losing her grip on COVID and the NHS is in crisis. This pressure is only going to build as we move towards winter. So when will she give us a real plan to get our health service back on track? First Minister. Um, we have a recovery plan. Uh, the NHS, supported by government, uh, starts planning for winter uh, much, much earlier in the year. Those plans are there. There is enormous pressure on our National Health Service right now. Uh, that is uh, partly because of rising COVID cases, which many countries, uh, because of the Delta variant, uh, are grappling with right now. Um, I would say in passing that it, had it been down to Douglas Ross, uh, we wouldn't even have in place some of the mitigations against COVID that we do have in place because he wanted us to remove all of them and have no protections um, against the transmission of COVID. Uh, so as a responsible government, we will do what requires to be done to protect the public against COVID, and we will do that for as long as is necessary. Uh, we will also support our NHS with a billion pounds uh, of additional targeted resource to support uh, recovery. When I saw uh, one of the Tory spokespersons uh, commenting on this last week, the day I think the recovery plan was published, uh, she seemed to be uh, saying that it was bad that we committed £1 billion because the Tories had wanted us to commit to £600 million. So I wasn't entirely sure I followed that logic. On, COVID, on long COVID, uh, we have invested, I think, £2.5 million on research projects. Uh, we've invested money in support services through Chest Heart Stroke Scotland that are making a number of very legitimate points today about the further work we need to do to ensure support for those suffering from long COVID. Uh, so we'll continue to do what needs to be done to take the decisions to support the NHS and to support the country uh, to get through this COVID crisis. That's the responsible uh, manner that people expect from their government. And I welcome uh, all contributions from across this chamber to that, but perhaps Douglas Ross can raise his game a little bit from you know, screaming about U-turns and, and things like that and actually uh, be part of finding the solutions that the country needs right now. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presiding officer, in the past 18 months, our NHS staff have performed remarkably under pressure. I know everyone in this chamber agrees. But even before this pandemic, they were undervalued, under-resourced and overworked. This week, we have seen the number of people on NHS waiting lists rise to over 600,000. Does the First Minister agree that this is a humiliation for the SNP and a tragedy for the tens of thousands of patients languishing on ever-lengthening lists? First Minister. Um, it is the responsibility of the government to support the NHS and help NHS staff uh, get through what is a 
uh, an extremely challenging situation for countries across the world. Most people, I think, recognise that we are in a global pandemic that has had a significant impact on our National Health Service. Anna Sarwar is right uh, to uh, say that there were challenges in our National Health Service before COVID, uh, but as we can see from uh, the waiting times improvement plan that was in place there, uh, waiting times uh, were starting to be reduced by the investment that we had made. Obviously, we all know the impact that COVID has had uh, on the National Health Service. That's why the recovery plan, backed by the £1 billion of additional investment, looking to build the capacity in our National Health Service this year in terms of inpatients and day cases, a 10% increase in capacity over the five years in inpatients, 20% and outpatients, 10% over uh, the five-year period. Also reforms uh, to the way healthcare is delivered. Uh, I visited the Golden Jubilee just last week to look at some of the innovations around robotic procedures, uh, around changes to how diagnostic operations are done. Uh, so I will not stand here um, and in any way underplay the challenge, uh, but the support for the National Health Service through record funding and increased funding, support for staff, uh, the biggest agenda for change pay rise in the history of devolution, the largest pay rise across the UK, to make sure that we are delivering for patients as we come out of and recover from COVID. Again, I think that's what people look to their government to do. Anna Sarwar. I, and I note the First Minister didn't answer the question, and, and the reason why she didn't is because I was actually quoting Nicola Sturgeon in 2003. All I did was replace the word Labour with SNP. The difference, though, is in 2003, Nicola Sturgeon was saying a list of over 84,000 people was a humiliation. What we are talking about today is lists of over 600,000 compared to 84,000. And I know Nicola Sturgeon says it's because of the pandemic. But let's look at the stats. Before the pandemic, there were 450,000 people languishing on NHS waiting lists before the pandemic even began. That's humiliation. Every one of them an anxious human being and a worried family. And these long lists are meaning more complicated cases presenting at A&E. This month, the worst A&E waiting times since records began. 24,000 of our fellow citizens waiting more than four hours. 4,000 of our fellow citizens waiting over eight hours. And almost 1,000 of our fellow citizens waiting over 12 hours, while ambulances are queuing outside hospitals. So, First Minister, if you were looking at those 24,000 patients in the eye, if you were looking at those 600,000 patients on waiting lists in the eye, what would you say to them? First Minister. I'd say to them that my responsibility is to support the National Health Service to recover from a global pandemic. Yeah. Because the difference between now and 2003 is not the difference Anna Sarwar tried to suggest. The difference is a global pandemic that has placed significant pressure on our National Health Service. Before the pandemic, the difference was the changing demographics of our country. That every single nation across the UK is grappling this. That's why this government has ensured record investment in the National Health Service, record investment that would not have happened had Labour stayed in government, record staff numbers in our National Health Service, a recovery plan that targets a billion pounds to build the capacity of our National Health Service. So what I would say to patients is that, yes, I know in opposition, because I've been there, it's easy to come up with the slogans. In government, the responsibility is to deliver the investment, to support the staff and to make Thank the changes you. for patients. Thank you. And that is exactly what we're going to continue to do. Anna Sarwa. The, the problem the First Minister has is she accepts she relied on slogans in opposition. She's kept relying on slogans in government. And that's the problem for people across this country. So I say directly to the First Minister, she can't ignore the fact it was 450,000 before the pandemic, and she thought 84,000 was a humiliation in 2003. Doctors, nurses and patients agree that the NHS is in crisis. And we need more than the thin recovery plan produced by this government. More a slogan and PR exercise than a genuine effort to rebuild our NHS. So let's look at what the experts say. A recovery plan that the BMA called unrealistic. A workforce plan that nurses have called woefully poor. A recovery plan that means that we won't meet the 62-day cancer standard for another five years. That's on top of it not being met for the past nine years. That will mean people diagnosed late, treatment starting late, and lives being lost as a result. 
So, First Minister, will you listen to what the professionals on the front line and patients are telling you? Will you recognise that this plan isn't good enough and isn't working? And with peak pressures of winter on their way, will you act before it's too late? First Minister. We will continue to support the plan with investment, a billion pounds of investment, 1,500 additional staff uh, for the national treatment centres. So we will continue to support uh, the NHS in that way. If Anna Sarwar wants to come forward in the forthcoming budget process and point to where he thinks we should uh, take extra money uh, to add to that, I will be very happy uh, to listen to that. But he has to do that with responsibility uh, and not simply uh, in the way that suggests he can just conjure money out of of nowhere. In terms of uh, the waiting times, we have a big responsibility to get waiting times uh, back on track. Incidentally, uh, one of the other differences between now and 2003 is our waiting times targets are so much yeah. more ambitious yeah. Yeah. Uh, than they were yeah. under Labour yeah. uh, because we are delivering more, yeah. more yeah. Uh, for Easy patients. But the last, the last point, the last point, presiding officer. Excuse is me. We will hear. The First Minister. Thank you. The last point I think it is appropriate to make right now is this one. Uh, nobody on the government benches uh, in any way underplays the seriousness of the situation we face right now. Nobody underplays uh, how difficult the challenges ahead are uh, for the NHS in particular, but for all of society. But it is only a matter of months uh, that the Scottish people had the opportunity to look at all of this and make a choice about who they trusted, who they had confidence in to lead the country through these challenges. Uh, and they chose this government, and that is a responsibility we take seriously each and every day as we continue to navigate this country through this crisis, uh, through the crisis and into recovery. And that is the responsibility we dedicate ourselves today and every day we are in office. Thank you. I will now call constituency supplementaries and I call Douglas Lumsden. Um, First Minister, I, along with 400 others in the north east of Scotland, are taking part in the Novavax COVID vaccine trial. The NHS Inform website has no record of all these volunteers being vaccinated and therefore we cannot download proof of vaccination and therefore no QR code. Will the First Minister join me in thanking those volunteers and also ensure that these volunteers are not excluded from any events that may require proof of vaccination using the QR code based system. First Minister. Uh, can I thank the member for raising this issue? Uh, and firstly, I would take the opportunity to thank everybody who's participated in a vaccine trial because they have uh, contributed hugely uh, towards the safety uh, and well-being of all of us. Uh, we have already uh, made clear that nobody uh, who took part in those trials, including uh, the member, uh, will in any way be disadvantaged. The vaccination will be recognised. Uh, we are working on ensuring uh, that that can be evidence. And I will write to the member to update on exactly how that will happen. And I call Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the situation at St Ninian's High School in Kirkintilloch, where earlier this week, due to a COVID outbreak, 405 of the 850 pupils were absent from school. Can I therefore ask the First Minister what support schools like St Ninian's should expect from public health teams when outbreaks such as this occur, and why the deadline for school ventilation improvements was set for the October midterm rather than the start of school's uh, term in mid-August? First Minister. Uh, on that latter point, it was to uh, allow uh, schools and local authorities the opportunity as uh, the, the schools uh, came back to assess the ventilation right across the school estate and to make sure that they were using CO2 monitors to do that and to put in place uh, any remedial plans that are required and that uh, the, the ongoing uh, nature of that work has been closely uh, monitored. It is incumbent on uh, local public health teams to provide appropriate support to schools or to any other uh, setting that is experiencing an outbreak. Uh, we did change and this was set out to Parliament, uh, the rules around uh, contact tracing and isolation in schools to try to uh, reduce the number of young people that were being asked to uh, isolate and therefore have disruption to their education when uh, they were not uh, in reality uh, at risk of getting uh, COVID. So there, there is now a risk-based approach being taken uh, to that, uh, led by tests and protecting public health teams. Um, and public health teams uh, are there in every area of Scotland uh, to offer advice and support uh, to schools or others who need it. And Jamie Green. 
Thank you. The First Minister will be aware that temporary changes to the intensive care unit and any trauma care at Inverclyde Royal Hospital in Greenock will now be made permanent despite fierce opposition, a decision which will see hundreds of patients moved to Glasgow. This flies in the face of a commitment by the Health Board and by ministers in this very chamber that no such decision would take place without full consultation. Can I ask the First Minister if she will offer a firm commitment to the users of Inverclyde Royal Hospital, including its A&E and ICU departments, that those departments in their full capacity are there to stay to meet the full needs of all patients in the west of Scotland? First Minister. Um, I'll happily write to the member with more detail on this. Certainly my understanding is that these changes are not permanent and wouldn't be permanent without full and proper uh, consultation, but I'm happy to uh, write to or ask the Health Secretary to write to the member with more uh, information on that point. Question number three, Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Tuesday. Alex Cole-Hamilton. I'm grateful for that answer. I will state this clearly where others have not. I and my party are fundamentally opposed to vaccine passports as a matter of principle. Added to that, the rush to introduce this in short order throws up practical problems too. How will this keep up with vaccinations and the booster programme across borders? Because that's already in chaos. Hospitality see this as a threat and have no idea how they will police it. It's unclear what this means for young people. And will I need a vaccine passport to join a mass protest against vaccine passports? But above all, for the first time, Scots will have to provide private medical data to strangers to access freedoms in our society. Vaccines are the way out of the pandemic, but vaccine passports are not. There's no time limit and an open door for expansion. So can I ask the First Minister, where does this stop? First Minister. Oh. Can I say to Alex Cole Hamilton, I, I don't agree with him on many of the points, but I've got a lot more respect for his position than I do for some of what we heard earlier on, because it is a principled position and I think it is a, a legitimate debate. I've said before I have my own uh, concerns about the use of vaccine certification, uh, but uh, my view is based on the following. Uh, we are still in the grip of a pandemic. This is a highly infectious virus and therefore doing nothing over the next period is not an option. We've got to stem transmission and therefore it becomes a question of how do we do that in the least restrictive, most proportionate way. And therefore, you know, in terms of nightclubs, for example, it may be as we get into winter, I, I hope this wouldn't be the case, but it may be that the choice is not vaccine certification eh, or no uh, restriction at all around at nightclubs, it may be something like vaccine certification or nightclubs having to have heavier restrictions and, and perhaps seeing uh, closure again, which none of us want to see. So this is a proportionate step. Uh, I hope it will be a time limited step. It will be very uh, limited in terms of the application to settings. I said yesterday uh, we do not intend uh, certainly at this stage, and we would not do this without full parliamentary uh, consultation either, to extend it to hospitality more generally. Uh, vaccine certification schemes are, are operating in many countries, Ireland, uh, for example, uh, the, the closest uh, to us, in many countries uh, on a much uh, wider ranging basis than I set out yesterday. Uh, I wish we weren't here. I, I genuinely wish we weren't in this position, but we are, and therefore we've got to think about every proportionate measure we can take to try to protect people. So we will set out the detail on this. There are some legitimate questions posed there that we, and, and some of them we have to work with other countries to make sure we have interoperability. None of these things are straightforward in the circumstances we are in. But my judgment is that this is a proportionate step, but of course it will be Parliament who gets to decide that next week. We'll now move on to general supp supplementaries and I call Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Today, a consultation in England and Wales will close, which proposes increasing the qualifying age for free prescriptions from 60 to the state age pension of 66. Age UK have branded this move as a kick in the teeth for older people. This highlights the difference between the progressive SNP government in Scotland and the cruel politics in Westminster. Can the First Minister confirm that no one in Scotland will be left struggling or unable to afford medicines that they need to stay as healthy as possible and that prescriptions will remain free for all? First Minister. Uh, yes, it is certainly uh, the position of this government that uh, free prescriptions will remain. People should have access to the medicines they need without uh, charge and, and without, as some people used to, to have to do, making invidious choices between taking their medicines and 
uh, feeding themselves. I never want to, to return to that. Um, in my view, it beggars belief that there is a consultation on taking away free prescriptions uh, elsewhere in the UK for those over 60. It's not my decision, obviously, but I, I certainly hope uh, that we don't see that direction of travel. But I can be uh, absolutely categoric that certainly as long as uh, this government is in office, uh, free prescriptions are here to stay. Jackie Bailey. Health professionals in Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland have published a long-term COVID action plan today. We know that at least 74,000 people are living with long COVID and the numbers are rising. Many of them are not getting the services they need. So will the First Minister agree with the recommendations in the report, in particular the creation of a long COVID fund for health boards to access? First Minister. Well, Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland um, are doing a, a fantastic job. They are doing that job uh, supported by funding from the Scottish Government. I think they have made um, a number of very important points today. They have published an action plan which has four key uh, recommendations. I do broadly uh, have sympathy with all of them, and, uh, but we want to discuss them in detail with Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland, which is uh, what we will do. I think recommendation four is a long COVID capacity fund, um, and in the course of our budget discussions, we will give uh, that very serious consideration, as we will do with the other three main recommendations recommendations as well. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our exam system, just like our education system, must be there to serve all pupils. That has not been the case in the last two years, and that's shameful. But having considered the latest OECD report, does the First Minister agree that it would be unacceptable moving forward to create a situation where some young people could leave school with no option or opportunity to gain an externally assessed exam-based qualification? And does she recognise that exams are not a British Victorian legacy, but a Scottish education tradition? First Minister. Um, yeah, I do recognise uh, the important role of exams in the Scottish educational tradi tradition and not just the Scottish educational tradition. Uh, there is uh, a need, I think, to properly consider for the future how we certificate the achievements of young people and what the correct balance is between uh, formal exams and ongoing uh, assessment. I, I think that is a debate we should all uh, enter into and we should come at it from uh, the perspective of what is best for uh, our young people. And I look forward to having uh, views and contributions from across the range of uh, perspectives uh, on that. Uh, and of course, we will continue to take uh, responsible decisions as we get our education system uh, back uh, on track and uh, through the recovery from COVID as well. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government regarding reports of retail stock and staff shortages in the run-up to Christmas. First Minister. Uh, well, the Scottish Ministers first wrote to the UK Government about this emerging problem uh, back in July. Uh, the Rural Affairs Secretary has written again this week seeking a meeting to discuss these challenges. Um, I think the fact that we've had to ask for such a meeting tells its own story about uh, how urgently or otherwise the UK Government is treating this issue. Uh, we've warned repeatedly of the damage that would be caused by Brexit. We knew that the loss of freedom of movement would be particularly damaging. And sadly, we're now seeing staff shortages putting real pressure on food and drink supplies. Um, you know, images of healthy food rotting in the fields are astonishing. Frankly, uh, for this whole uh, sorry situation, uh, the Tories should frankly be hanging their heads in shame. Stuart McMillan. Thank the First Minister for that reply. And the British Retail Consortium is the latest organisation to warn of further price increases and disruption in the coming months due to the Tory-led Brexit. Does the First Minister agree with me that Brexit has been nothing short of a disaster and that Scotland is increasingly vulnerable under Westminster control and that the only way to keep Scotland safe from the long-term economic and social devastation of the Tory-led Brexit is for Scotland to secure our independence? First Minister. Well, the Conservatives don't like to hear this, but we right now, not just in Scotland but across the UK, are in the quite incredible situation. Uh, unlike other countries across the European Union, uh, so this is not about COVID, uh, of seeing shortages in our supermarkets, of having shortages uh, of other supplies, of having children told that there might not be toys at Christmas because of the disruption to supply uh, chains. And, you know, I really do think Conservatives 
should take some responsibility because it is entirely inflicted uh, by their obsession with Brexit. There are two things I think it's important to remember here. Firstly, Scotland did not vote for Brexit. And secondly, it was utterly reckless of the Conservatives to plough ahead with Brexit in the middle of a global pandemic. And, you know, these issues do illustrate the fact that right now these are things that are being done to Scotland, eh, not by Scotland. And the only solution to that is for us to take control of all of our affairs in Scotland. And yes, that does mean being an independent country. <laughs> Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, has the First Minister ever told a senior Scottish police officer that she has lost confidence in them? And would it be appropriate for a First Minister to do so? Um, that question is not relevant to the question. Um, supplementary questions should refer to the question that was asked. Um, I will therefore move on to question number five from Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in response to the increase in ambulance waiting times in parts of Scotland. First Minister. The Scottish Ambulance Service is currently carrying out a national review of demand and capacity. Uh, this review will ensure that the right resources are in place across the country to help meet both present and future predicted demand. Uh, over the past four years, we've invested over a billion pounds and continue to invest with just over £20 million in additional funding being made available to support this re review. So in the uh, north of Scotland, uh, this has resulted in 67 extra frontline staff, a mixture of experienced paramedics, newly qualified paramedics and technicians along with nine patient transport service staff. The Scotland-wide uh, figure is 296. Uh, work is also underway in partnership with health boards across the country to put improvement measures in place to reduce any unnecessary delays for ambulances waiting at hospital uh, to hand over patients. Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, the First Minister whizzed through that very quickly. I had to take note very quickly, so uh, make sure we don't miss it. In, re in recent weeks, NHS Grampian has said that staff are under more pressure than at any other time throughout the pandemic. There have been reports of people across the northeast waiting up to 20 hours, that's 2-0, 20 hours to be taken to hospital by ambulance. Ambulances are being stacked outside hospital entrances because there simply isn't the capacity to treat more patients. A 28-page plan just is not good enough. Will the First Minister tell us what immediate action the Scottish Government is taking to address the crisis? First Minister. Well, I, I actually answered that in my first answer, but since the member says she didn't quite catch it, I'll go through some of the detail again, because she's right. Uh, there are challenges on our ambulance service because of the pressures in our National Health Service uh, caused by COVID. So we haven't just produced a 28-page plan, important though that is. Uh, what we have done is invest an additional, additional to the £1 billion over the last four years that I spoke about, £20 million uh, to support the ongoing review of the Scottish Ambulance Service. So what I said is in the north of Scotland, this has already resulted in 67 extra frontline staff a mixture of experienced and newly qualified paramedics uh, and technicians and nine patient transport service. I said that uh, that's uh, more than uh, 250 uh, across Scotland. Uh, so that's what we are doing immediately. Um, in terms of uh, the performance of the ambulance service, again, under pressure, and let me uh, take the opportunity to express my gratitude to paramedics and technicians and everybody working in the service. But in the most uh, recent week, uh, the ambulance service advised that they responded to round about 10,500, 10 emergency uh, incidents. That was up 1.2% from the previous week. And for uh, the most urgent uh, calls, the median national response time uh, was 8 minutes 55 seconds. So I recognise uh, that there will be people waiting longer than that and there will be some people who have waited completely unacceptable lengths of time. That's why we are investing in this way. But we are taking the action, making the investment and supporting the ambulance service in the excellent work that it does. Pam Duncan Glancy. I think I may have pressed my button I'm too early, presiding officer. I was hoping to come in after a different question. Thank you. In that, in that case, we'll move on to question number six from Neil Gray. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagement the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government regarding the reduction to universal credit that is set to take place at the end of September. 
First Minister. Well, as I've set out in Parliament on previous occasions, we have strongly urged UK ministers not to push people into poverty through the cut of £20 to universal credit. Uh, most recently, the Social Justice Secretary joined with colleagues in Wales and Northern Ireland to write to the UK Government on this matter. Uh, I know the same calls have come from the Children uh, Commissioners, Poverty Campaigners, even uh, the Prime Minister's own uh, backbenches. And uh, although I'm not sure we've heard it from the Conservative uh, benches in this Parliament, but I may, I may be wrong on that. Uh, we know that families are struggling. This cut risks pushing a further 60,000 people, including 20,000 children in Scotland, into poverty. And just to put it in context, it would be the biggest overnight reduction to a basic rate of social security since the beginning of the modern welfare state more than 70 years ago. So I hope we could unite in this parliament uh, to call on the UK government not to do this, not to take that £20 a week away from the people who need it most. Neil Gray. I, I thank you, President Officer, and I thank the First Minister for that answer. It's shocking, isn't it? The Secretary of State, Theresa Coffey, responded to the Four Nations Committee Chair's joint letter calling for the uplift to be kept by saying they are prioritising getting people into work, ignoring the 1.7 million people on universal credit who the DWP don't expect to get uh, or find work, and almost two-fifths of all of those on universal credit recipients who are already in work, but still need to use services like Paul's Parcels Food Bank in Shots, who I visited last week. Doesn't this show the limitation of our hybrid, only part devolved social security system, uh, where the benefit of the likes of the Scottish Child Payment will be wiped out and tens of thousands of people in Scotland being forced into the poverty at the discretion of the Chancellor's pen? First Minister. There is a really serious issue here. I mean, the, the removal, uh, which I, I hope doesn't go ahead, but the intended removal of the £20 a week will push thousands and thousands of people into poverty. And that is not something that any of us uh, should sit back and be in any way comfortable about. And Neil Gray is absolutely right to say that the Tories would rather people were in work. Well, of course, we want to support people into work where they can work. But so many of people, the people on universal credit are already working. Yeah. That is the yeah. point that is being missed here. Many others uh, are not able to work, but they will all have this £20 a week taken away. And as I said a moment ago, in Scotland alone, that's 20,000 children pushed into poverty. And that's why the other uh, serious aspect of this is the one that Neil Gray raises. We are, uh, we have already, and we're rolling out uh, the Scottish Child Payment, and there is rightly calls for us to go further with that and to increase the value of the Child Payment, which we're committed to doing. Uh, but this cut simply takes away money that we're trying to put into the pockets of the poorest in our society. It's a ridiculous way of these decisions being taken. So, you know, you don't even have to support independence, surely, to say that it would be much better if we could join up all of this within the powers of this parliament so that we can decide and set aside the resources we need to lift children out of poverty, not to see them pushed back into poverty. So this is an issue, not the only one, but I hope this is an issue where we could find some real consensus across this chamber and act to tackle child poverty, not to do what we can while watching our government elsewhere do the complete opposite. Pam Duncan Blancy. Thank you, and I thank the presiding officer and the chamber for their patience with my uh, error in pressing the button too early, earlier on. Um, I, I hope that every MP will do everything they can to retain the uplift in universal credit. To remove it is abhorrent. The removal of the £20 uplift to universal credit will mean some families in Scotland will no longer be eligible for the Scottish Child Payment. Will the Scottish Government use the powers it has here and ensure that those families who would have been eligible for the Child Payment continue to get it? First Minister. Uh, we'll do everything we can through our powers and our resources to make sure uh, that we lift children out of poverty, don't allow them to be pushed into poverty. And I, I, I absolutely uh, respect and sympathise with the sentiment behind that question. But there is a really hard issue for us here in this Parliament. Uh, every time uh, the Conservatives at Westminster make a cut to Social Security uh, and you know, save the money from that cut, they don't then transfer that money to the Scottish uh, Parliament. So every time we have to mitigate a cut like that, we're having to take money 
money uh, from elsewhere within the budget. It is an unsustainable uh, way to proceed. So we all want to do that, but that goes back to my previous point. And I, uh, I'm not that hopeful I'll get Conservative agreement to this point. I am more hopeful that I will get the agreement uh, of, of people at Pam Duncan Glancy, because I recognise the sincerity here. We need to bring all of these powers within the Scottish Parliament so that we can do these things sensibly um, and we can... You know, the, conserv the Conservatives, Conservatives who cannot bring themselves to oppose their own Chancellor taking £20 a week away from the poorest children in our society have no room to lecture me about using powers in this Parliament. Let those of us, those of us who genuinely care about lifting children out of poverty, come together in opposition to this callous, uncaring Tory government. Question number seven, Pauline McNeill. To ask the First Minister what plans the Scottish Government has to tackle public displays of anti-Irish racism and anti-Catholic prejudice. First Minister. Well, can I say... Uh, very clearly there is never ever any excuse or justification for hatred or bigotry and I unequivocally condemn anti-Irish racism and anti-Catholic prejudice and it should be called what it is and it should be called out. Uh, Scotland is a diverse multicultural society. Uh, this diversity strengthens us as a nation uh, and that's uh, why it's so important that we tackle all forms of prejudice and discrimination. Uh, Police Scotland of course is committed to protecting uh, our communities and will act on all incidents of uh, bigoted violence, disorder uh, and vandalism including follow-up investigations based on evidence gathered and those who commit criminal acts motivated by prejudice can expect to feel the full, full force of, of justice and I know the police have issued uh, comment uh, about the progress of a particular investigation just this morning. Pauline McNeill. I thank the First Minister for that strong answer. I hope that she agrees that there is still a clear problem with a minority of anti-Irish and anti-Catholic prejudice and a growing feeling that if those terms were sought with any other minority group, that the sentiments displayed on our streets would be treated far more seriously. And for the avoidance of doubt, I'm sure the First Minister is aware that the famine song contains the words, the famine is over, why don't you go home, as confirmed by Lord Carloway in his judgment in 2009. Hey, First Minister, I do welcome that there have been three arrests. I understand last night in relation, in relation to this particular incident and Rangers Football Club, which I applaud, have just announced indefinite ban of three members that they identified were involved in singing the famine song. And I think that has to be welcomed. I just want the First Minister just to reassure me that Police Scotland will, be, uh, will respond proportionately to these offences. And in doing so, I offer my full support to the First Minister to work with her and with everyone to ensure that all forms of racism and all forms of bigotry are stamped out in Scotland. First Minister. Well, can, I, can I thank Pauline McNeill for, for the question, uh, the way in which she asked the question and the offer of support. I think we should all come together uh, to tackle this. Um, can I say clearly, and I know everybody across this chamber uh, will support uh, this, uh, I take the view that anybody who chooses to live in Scotland, whether they and their families have been here for generations or whether they have come to Scotland very recently, is home. Uh, this is their home and we should uh, not allow anybody ever uh, to say, oh. presiding oh. officer. I would, I would be grateful if members at all times in this chamber remember that we are privileged to represent the people of Scotland and that at all times in this chamber we treat one another with great dignity and respect. And I would be grateful if we could hear the First Minister. Thank you. Presiding officer, I have just had a comment made to me from a sedentary position. I would not normally do this, but I am so deeply offended. Uh, by the comment uh, that I do want after this session to take it up with you uh, so that the, with your permission the member may be asked to reflect on that and to withdraw that comment. It was a comment that would have been unacceptable <laughs> unacceptable in any context but in the context of what we are discussing here right now I, I am deeply aggrieved that any member thought that was an appropriate thing to say. Um, can I uh, go back to uh, the very important question that was asked? Uh, all of us, all of us 
have a duty to stand against racism, prejudice and bigotry. Uh, and I dedicate myself, not just as First Minister, but as a citizen of this country, to always doing so. And I uh, look forward to working with anybody uh, who stands with me and with people across Scotland in that. And I thank Polly McNeill again for her question. Thank you. That, that concludes First Minister's questions. We will now move on to members' business, and I would ask members leaving the chamber to do so quietly. Thank you. the Basques, the Galicians in the, uh, the Basque. Just looking at the, the overall share uh, numbers for Scotland at the moment, the SNP 46.4%.